On July 2, 1934, Crescent Lake Bible Camp opened its first season of Christian camps for young people. This camp was the dream of Arthur Perkins, a Presbyterian minister from Merrill, Wisconsin. Located at Crescent Lake near Rhinelander, Wisconsin, this was his dream of a camp that would be accessible and affordable to young people, but also of a camp that would preach the Word of God, the pure gospel of Jesus Christ from the scriptures without compromise. This camp was not without controversy. In fact, in 1935, charges were brought against Reverend Perkins for his involvement here at this camp. A trial was held, a conviction was secured, and a censure was brought against him. We are here at Crescent Lake Bible Camp for a conference examining the life and legacy of this remarkable servant of Jesus Christ. In our conference, there are seven lectures and four sermons written by Reverend Perkins, delivered by me, Reverend Brian DeYoung, the pastor of Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. This conference is the production of the archivist and historian of the Presbytery of Wisconsin and Minnesota of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church done in conjunction with our good friends from WVCY-TV and with the help of the Crescent Lake board and staff. Well, good morning and welcome back to our conference on the life and legacy of Arthur Perkins. I'm Pastor Brian DeYoung, the archivist and historian of the Presbytery of Wisconsin and Minnesota. And this morning we're going to talk about the new church. But before I tell you about this, I need to explain a little bit about names. Art Perkins was a member of the Presbyterian Church of the USA. The new church, when it formed in the summer of 1936, called itself the Presbyterian Church of America, PCA. Quite soon, the old church got upset about the name of the new church. So they took the new church to court and they asked the judge to force us to change our name because they said it would be too confusing, PCUSA versus PCA. The judge in the case agreed with them and required us to change our name. And so different options were discussed and they finally settled on the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, OPC. Now what makes this even more confusing is the fact that there is a denomination, one of our sister denominations, called the Presbyterian Church in America, the PCA. Now, this sister denomination, the PCA, is not the same as the PCA of 1936. So the PCA of 1936 becomes the OPC, and then in the 1970s, we have a little sister who calls herself the PCA. Clear as mud. I hope that that helps a little bit. Well, what did Arthur Perkins expect when he appealed his judicial conviction to the General Assembly of the PCUSA? What did he anticipate happening as a result of his appeal? There is a sense in which he made a good faith effort to bring justice to a very unjust situation. Much of his trial had been blatantly unconstitutional, and certainly the censure levied against him was excessive. He wanted his own denomination to make amends for what they had done to him. That was only right and fair. But realistically speaking, what did he hope for? In a letter to Dr. J. Gressa Machen, 
on September 19, 1935, Perkins said, we are looking to your leadership to know just what to do when this series of trials are over and a number of us out of the church we have loved and have given so much of our lifeblood for. Yet, the direction of our actions must finally be the word of God. That letter was written after his presbytery trial had concluded, but before his appeal to the Synod of Wisconsin had been heard. Even then, he realized that when this series of trials had concluded, a number of us, he says, will be out of the church we have loved and given so much of our lifeblood for. I believe that he expected to be expelled from the PCUSA. I also believe that Perkins anticipated a new church forming after the General Assembly of the PCUSA had disposed of their appeals. To this end, Perkins formed a chapter of the Presbyterian Constitutional Covenant Union in his city of Merrill, and he promised to help organize other chapters in other towns. The Presbyterian Constitutional Covenant Union was supposed to be an organization fighting for change from within the PCUSA. But after the expulsion of Machen, Buswell, McIntyre, DeWard, Perkins, and the others, the viability of that plan evaporated. Nevertheless, Perkins was a vocal supporter of the efforts that were being spearheaded by Dr. Machen. After the PCUSA General Assembly in Syracuse, New York, Perkins and his wife and their friends, the Stevensons, traveled to New Jersey, where they visited the Jersey Shore and saw the Atlantic Ocean. From there, they journeyed on to Philadelphia in order to be in attendance at a meeting on June 11, 1936. Now, originally, this was planned to be an organizational meeting for the Presbyterian Constitutional Covenant Union organization, but events had changed the focus. As the meeting was called to order that day, Art Perkins was asked to give the opening prayer, which he did. Now, more than likely, this was arranged by Dr. Machen, who was then elected as moderator of what turned out to be the first General Assembly of the new church. Ministers and elders in attendance were given the opportunity to officially join the new church by subscribing to the following statement. We do solemnly declare, one, that the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are the word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice. Two, that the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms contain the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures. And three, that we subscribe to and maintain the principles of Presbyterian church government as being founded upon and agreeable to the Word of God. Now, Art Perkins was in full agreement with all three of those principles, and he signed his name and became a founding member of the new denomination. As business was transacted that day, Perkins had several concerns that he was especially watching for. He wrote a letter to a friend, John McDonald, who had been critical of the new denomination and of Dr. Machen. And Perkins said to McDonald, I went to the First General Assembly with three great questions in my mind. One, would the new church declare itself officially on the pre, post, or ah position? It would not. 
Secondly, would the new church close its doors in a hard and fast rule so that no man could enter its ministry without a college MA and a seminary training? Final word has not been spoken on this question, but if at last the doors are closed, I shall feel that it has gone beyond the scripture, although I believe in an educated and well-trained ministry. And then third, would the new church make any ruling on the property question? It did make such a statement, and here it is. All particular churches now connected with the Presbyterian Church of America and all particular churches which shall hereafter exist under its jurisdiction shall be entitled to hold, own, and enjoy their own local properties without any right of revision to the Presbyterian Church of America whatsoever, save as in hereafter provided. And that provision is only if, as, and when a particular church should become extinct. So in each of these three concerns, he was listening, watching, paying special attention, and he was satisfied on how the assembly handled each of those questions. Now, judging the general assembly as a whole, and Machen's performance as moderator in particular, Perkins was entirely positive. In the same letter to McDonald, he says, then I want to say a word about our first GA. I have been in many, many meetings in the old church and a number of them in the IFCA, but the most truly deliberative body I ever was a part of was that meeting. Dr. Machen was the moderator, and he was the fairest presiding officer I ever sat under, barring none. That's high praise. Writing to Dr. Machen, Perkins was effusive. More and more, I thank God for your stand through the years, and how I praise him for the wonderful meeting of the First General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church of America, I shall never forget your fairness as the moderator. Well, after the conclusion of the General Assembly, Reverend and Mrs. Perkins and their traveling companions headed home to Wisconsin. And Perkins describes the journey in a letter to Machen. We left Philadelphia at 3.45 Monday morning by automobile and arrived in Merrill at 10.15 p.m. Tuesday, having driven 1,112 miles, and we had six in the car. We did this so that I might be present at the meeting of Winnebago Presbytery called to transact the business set forth on the enclosed call for the meeting. There was a very large gathering of ministers and elders. Of course, in my case, there was nothing to do but proceed with the execution. When the judgment was read, the moderator proceeded to read the form of suspension, but when he came to the prayer, he said, that is about as far as I care to go. I then asked if I could make a statement, which was granted. I then read the enclosed communication. In accordance with my request, my name was dropped from the roll. Praise God. Now there's one little detail that he leaves out there. He also asked the moderator to completely fulfill the form by having someone offer prayer. And he asked very specifically for Reverend Marshall Olson to be the one to pray for him. Olson was unwilling, and so the moderator appointed someone else who offered the perfunctory prayer. Well, this important transaction was necessary, albeit grievous, 
to Arthur Perkins. He had concluded that the PCUSA was no longer a church that he cared to be associated with. He had joined the new denomination and he wanted to have a clean break between his old church and his new denomination. Now, another minister friend of his, the Reverend William Keelhorn, also attended the first general assembly of the new church, and Keelhorn subscribed in the same way that Perkins had. Keelhorn considered himself a member of the new church, but Keelhorn never renounced the jurisdiction of the PCUSA. And for that reason, the PCUSA pastored Keelhorn for some time following, even bringing a lawsuit against him several years later. Well, having cleared himself of any further association with the PCUSA, Perkins was free to begin pursuing the formation of the new congregation in Merrill. He let it be known that they would hold their first worship service on Sunday, June 21st at the American Legion Hall in Merrill. This was a rather new facility at the time, and it was just across First Street, literally a tenth of a mile from the Merrill PCUSA church where he had served. The main floor in the American Legion Hall is 32 feet wide by 80 feet long. In a letter to his supporters, Perkins tells about that first service. I began my new work by holding services in the American Legion building last Sunday. My only public notice was an article in the local paper, reprint of which is enclosed. Although no one was solicited to come, Pupils and teachers continued to appear until at the opening exercises, the Sunday school was able to begin with 46 pupils and 10 teachers, including the superintendent and nine teachers of my old church. The church service followed with an attendance of 101. I was greatly moved to find almost every officer of my old church present. Three of the five elders, the fourth unavoidably detained away. Every trustee, the church treasurer and secretary, and practically all the leaders of other groups. God graciously answers prayer. One fourth of the $37 offering was set aside to be divided between the Independent Board of Presbyterian Foreign Missions and the Committee on Church Extension of the Presbyterian Church of America. Over 40 persons have signified their intention of joining with me in forming an organization to be affiliated with the newly founded Presbyterian Church. Those of my last congregation who are with me in this new enterprise have left behind them an imposing building and all its equipment. Now at that first service, Perkins provided a form letter for members of the Merrill PCUSA to use in severing their connection to the old church. And in that letter, it states, we entered into this church voluntarily because we believed that its doctrines and policies were founded upon and agreeable to the word of God. Because we now believe that it has apostatized from the word of God, we no longer wish to retain any connection with it. Therefore, that we may continue the, the true spiritual succession of the Presbyterian Church in the USA in this city, and fulfill our obligations as Christian men and women, we hereby declare our connection with the above-named church to be at an end and do request that our names be dropped from the role of the Merrill Presbyterian Church. Now, from that point forward, 
Community Presbyterian Church of the PCA, which is again later the OPC, that was their church, and Arthur Perkins was their pastor. Perkins' next order of business was to help establish a presbytery for the new denomination in the state of Wisconsin. And to that end, Perkins had written a letter on June 18 updating Machen about developments in his situation. And toward the end of that letter, he asks, will there be a presbytery set up out this way, say in Wisconsin, before the next General Assembly? What are the steps necessary for us to take? Machen referred this matter to Edwin Ryan, who was the General Secretary for Home Missions and Church Extension. And Ryan answered Perkins on June 23, telling him that the Home Missions Committee would authorize a Presbytery of Wisconsin as soon as there were two ministers and an elder living in Wisconsin, as well as church members. In addition to Perkins, there were several other ministers living in Wisconsin. The Reverend John DeWard from Cedar Grove would join with them, as would the Reverend William Keelhorn from Oxford, Wisconsin. The elders of Community Presbyterian Church in Merrill would satisfy the need for ruling elder representation, as well as elders from Calvary Presbyterian Church in Cedar Grove. Well, on July 1, 1936, the Committee on Home Missions and Church Extension met and voted to erect the Presbytery of Wisconsin and Upper Michigan. They appointed Perkins as the convener, and they urged him to contact John DeWard. During the month of July, a flurry of correspondence went back and forth from Merrill to Philadelphia, ironing out all the details for the new Presbytery. Perkins really wanted Machen to come and to be part of his installation in September. And he urged him, almost begged him to come. Machen wanted to come, but Machen had committed himself in so many other places and the travel schedule simply would not work. One of the things that Perkins said in his argument to try to persuade Machen is that this is going to be a historic occasion. So I kind of think of him as the first historian of the new presbytery. So they uh, could not get Machen, but Perkins did invite Edwin Ryan to come for the installation to be held on September 4 and also to have a conference here at Crescent Lake. And so that weekend, which would have been Labor Day weekend, they had the installation on Sunday and they had a conference with John DeWard, Edwin Ryan, or Ryan and others teaching and preaching here at the Crescent Lake Bible Camp. Now the very first page of the minutes of the Presbytery of Wisconsin and Upper Michigan Read as follows. The meeting was called to order in the home of the Reverend A.F. Perkins, 1412 6th Street, on July 30, 1936. Reverend Perkins led a devotional service, which was followed with a season of prayer. Mr. Evers constituted the meeting with prayer. Ministers of the Presbyterian Church of America present were... Reverend A.F. Perkins, and Reverend William Keelhorn, ruling elder H.W. Hillegas. Reverend Perkins read a letter dated July 2, 1936, from the Home Missions and Church Extension Committee of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church of America, written by Reverend Edwin H. Ryan, appointing him as the convener of the Presbytery of Wisconsin and Upper Michigan and telling how to proceed with the organization of the same. Mr. H.W. Hillegas was asked to take the chair and announce the presbytery was prepared to hear nominations for the office of moderator. 
The names of Reverend A.F. Perkins and Reverend William Keelhorn were presented for nomination. The vote was a tie and the election was decided by the chair, Reverend A.F. Perkins being elected. Now that detail is so sweet. As the two ministers present were both nominated to be the moderator, they didn't vote for themselves. They voted for each other. And then the acting moderator, Mr. Hillegas, broke the tie and Perkins was the first moderator. Well, in addition to being appointed as convener and then elected as the first moderator of the new presbytery, Perkins was also elected to be the chairman of the Committee on Home Missions. Another matter that was connected to Perkins at that first meeting was the reception of the Community Presbyterian Church of Merrill and the approval of their call to the Reverend Arthur Perkins to be their pastor. Community Presbyterian Church was the first congregation enrolled in the new presbytery. And although they did not remain long with the presbytery after Perkins' death, their place is historically significant to us. Then finally, several other ministers were received into the presbytery that day, including John DeWard and the Reverend John Davies. Davies was appointed to minister among the Indians on the reservation near Gresham, Wisconsin, and Perkins was assigned to give oversight to his ministry there. The matter of home missions was a significant aspect of this new presbytery from the very start. Due to the small size of this group, they were all elected to be on the committee on home missions and church extension. Now from communications between Perkins and Philadelphia, it appears that he was organizing the home missions committee along the very same lines that he had used as field director in Winnebago. He had letterhead printed, which listed him as the chairman of the committee and as field secretary. Let me read for you a letter written to Edwin Ryan by Arthur Perkins on August 12, 1936. Dear brother, Yesterday marked the beginning of our missionary program under the Presbytery of Wisconsin. Less than two weeks after we organized, we started two missionaries, as I intimated in my last letter. Reverend John Davies, who lately resigned his work under the USA Church, began his work as our missionary to the Menominee Indians on their reservation and about half of the amount he was receiving as salary for a month came to him privately before he went on the field. Then, Reverend Elmer Seeger, the young man I wrote about who has applied to be received by the presbytery, went to Green Bay to begin a work there. A member of the old church has taken him in, giving him room and board for a couple of weeks while getting started. We believe these men are both started in strategic places. We are letting no grass grow under our feet. We believe the Sp Holy Spirit of God has led us in this setup. Now, I would like to know what young men you have to recommend for work pioneering in this state. I am positive there will be other openings soon. I hope when you come to us on the 4th of September that a number of places will be ready to set up work. We have nothing to offer here except great opportunities to preach the gospel with all of God's promises to see us through. I could write much on the marvelous leading in the setup of these two missionaries and the possibilities that await them, but time and space will not permit. Keep praying for us as we do for you, 
yours in him, Art Perkins. So there was much excitement on both sides about the possibilities in Wisconsin. The denominational Home Missions and Church Extension Committee saw Perkins as an experienced voice who could provide leadership not only regionally in Wisconsin, but denominationally. In a letter to Perkins dated September 10, Ryan said, I hope that you will obey your doctor now and stay in bed until you are fully recovered. Your efforts are greatly needed in Wisconsin, so you must be careful. And then in another letter to Mrs. Perkins on November 18, Ryan said, I consider Mr. Perkins to be one of the finest supporters of our cause. It grieves me very much to know that he has been laid aside in this way. Please know we are holding you up before the throne of grace, asking God to give you courage and strength, and asking him to restore Mr. Perkins to health and strength. Now, a month later, the denominational committee voted to provide $25 per month for Mr. Perkins' health care. And Ryan wrote, this is simply a small token of our respect and appreciation for what Mr. Perkins has meant to the Presbyterian Church of America. And later he would add, at the last committee meeting, special prayer was offered for Mr. Perkins. We hope and pray that the Lord will bring Perkins back to full strength of body and mind. Perkins' situation was also a matter of prayer at the Second General Assembly meeting on November 13. The Presbyterian Guardian reported that after the devotional service opening the Friday morning session, prayer was requested by Dr. Charles Sterling for the Reverend Arthur Perkins, who was reportedly seriously ill. Prayer was offered by Dr. Sterling and the clerk was instructed to convey to Mrs. Perkins the sympathy and concern of the assembly. Now, all of this testifies to the significant respect that was given to Art Perkins by his new denomination. Many people had followed the story of his trial in the PCUSA. He was viewed widely as one of the stalwarts in the fight against modernism, one who paid the price for his integrity. So in the space of a few months, Arthur Perkins had ended his relationship with the PCUSA. He had joined the new church. He had started a new congregation in Merrill, pioneered the first presbytery of the new church west of Philadelphia, and he laid the groundwork for home missions throughout the state of Wisconsin. Everything seemed to be turning out in good ways for a man who had suffered so greatly. And yet this summertime of hope would give way to a rapid decline as summer turned to fall. And we will look at that in our next lecture. Well, thank you for your attention to this video and this conference. I trust that it has been of spiritual encouragement and help to you, and that it has given you some historical data that you were not aware of. There will be a biography of Arthur Perkins forthcoming. The title is Standing Against Tyranny, The Life and Legacy of Arthur Perkins. I am the author, and it will be published through Amazon.com. Lord willing, we will also have an audiobook available for that. For information, please contact me, Brian DeYoung, at Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church, 4930 Green Valley Lane, Sheboygan, Wisconsin, 53083.